I don't, I don't need to go behind the podium, I guess. Um, uh, just to raise a hand, how many people are familiar or know of or heard of at least my first or last name? <laughs> Yeah, okay, a couple. That's, that's good, because I didn't want to, I don't know how much time I wanted to spend on uh, talking about who I am. Um, I'm not, I guess I, when I first heard that I was going to do this event, I, my first question was, well, why, why me? Why, why am I speaking to people instead of listening, which I still do quite a bit of. But uh, a little background about me is I started a computer business when I was in high school as a way to afford a Lamborghini Diablo, which was my dream car since second grade. Fastest car in the world, 202 miles an hour. I was absolutely obsessed with it. And I think it was because of that obsession, I actually ended up accomplishing that before my uh, 10 year high school reunion, which was, for some reason in my mind, a huge deal. I, you know, I was picturing some sort of movie esque sort of thing that I would show up in this car and not be a douchebag. And I <laughs> showed up in that car and looked like a douchebag. But um, <laughs> I actually posted on the Facebook thing, like, please don't, please don't think that I'm that guy. I, I am that guy, but don't. I'm not trying to be <laughs> that guy. And so everybody was really cool about it. And it actually made that experience that much more uh, gratifying. But uh, like Josh said, I, I'm a computer business guy. I started fixing uh, PCs out of my parents' home. And the day, the moment I turned 18, I signed a lease for a hill tank for a 500 square foot, $500 a month place in, up in Michigan. I'm from Michigan. And uh, my parents kicked me out of the house that night. I spent my 18th birthday at the office that was not renovated, so that was a very cold, cold floor. Um, my parents eventually uh, saw that I wasn't going to ruin their credit. That was the big thing that they were worried about, was I was going to trash their credit somehow, um, racking up the bills. But my business that first year made $78,000 in revenue, and I was ecstatic. I made zero dollars. I made no money off of that. It was all in and out, blowing it on, trying to fix computers instead of actually fixing them. Uh, I was breaking them more often and having to replace parts. So, so I, I'll be honest, I think the, the thing I can speak the best about, the most about here is um, the, the truly the most organic start of a business ever. Uh, I started it with no venture capital, no angel investing. I'm, I mean, you can count my parents as they let me stay at their house, but until they kicked me out when I was 22. I would, I would stay much longer. I would have owned the Lamborghini at my parents' house. I had no problem with that. <laughs> but um, so my parents were very, very. Um, supportive, um, but the business was truly started with no money. I hustled and tried to get everybody's business and, and grow it uh, from the bottom up. So I truly, I, I can speak a lot, of, uh, a lot to that. And that's really one of the reasons I started my YouTube channel, was all I wanted to do was show other people the shit that I had learned and over the, you know, too much time. I wasted too much time on a lot of things. And I wanted to help save other people time and while being mildly entertaining and swearing too much. That the kids who come up to me, their parents are like, can you turn it down a little bit, please? <laughs> so, so if I swear, I'm sorry, but that's, they say that you know, swearing is a, a person, more trustworthy person. I hope that correlation is true with me. Um, I, uh, like I said, I started the business when I was 16, started fixing neighbors' computers, and then truly, like I said, organically, the neighbors' computers turned into neighbors' businesses, and you know, there were car dealerships. And I mean, I was doing some of the weirdest things. I was moving furniture. I'm a computer guy, and I was moving furniture to, you know, at residential jobs and um, whatever I could do to, to, to pay the bills to make, to make uh, revenue. And it got into more of a medical IT. You know, we started fixing doctors' offices. And, you know, once you start doing something a lot, then you start telling other people that that's what you do. So we started saying, oh, you know, we're into medical IT, which is just a fancy way of saying we fix computers for doctors. And then, uh, you know, when you, I guess this is the coolest lesson I learned right there was that the, once you start getting specialized in something, you're become very well known for it. And so in the area, people would call us up and say, hey, you're the guys that understand all this HIPAA, which is uh, health information and uh, protection stuff, you know, keeping your patient records safe. Um, you guys seem to know what you're talking about. We want to bring you in and have you help us out. And so, you know, our reputation kind of preceded us and uh, it grew from there. Um, I still run that business, but then being the type of person I am, I get very restless and I started buying uh, real estate. You know, the building that I was in, um, I wanted it. I wanted it badly and um, it did not come through. The guys that owned it didn't sell it to me. I was very upset as a 21 year old through temper tantrum. <laughs> but uh, there was a building and if you guys have heard of Lazy Boy Chairs, that's the only Fortune 500 company in like my 
I would say 50 mile, 80 mile radius. It's the only Fortune 500 company in my area. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't come from money. I don't come from a lot of that sort of stuff. And like I said, it's very grassroots. And they are in my hometown. They were built and uh, created in Monroe, Michigan. There was a building directly across the street from us. It was a pet food store next to a McDonald's and a Wendy's. And, but it was a beautiful building. And I saw it go for sale. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy that building. I don't know how. I have no damn clue how I'm going to buy that building. But um, being 21 years old, I figured that you know I could beg my parents for money or something. I don't know. I Delusional, I went and signed a purchase agreement for a $600,000 building without any way of financing it. Um, so if you've ever wanted to know what it's like to sign a purchase agreement, put down $25,000 as a due diligence, which means uh, with what some of you guys might know more about this stuff than I do is um, due diligence means basically yes I'm serious here's 25 grand if I screw your time up if I don't come through you get to keep the $25,000 of mine for me wasting your time which I ended up doing I uh, if you've ever wondered what it's like to buy a building not be able to follow through and uh, not get financing in time and lose the building I know what that's like um, I, what happened was it is uh, I had my portion of the, the down payment. You know, you, you got you giving the down payment, then I was gonna have a bank finance it. So I had a neighbor who was a, a business loan officer, and I went over to his house and begged him to help me you know, write up all the documents. And now I had to have a business plan, which I didn't have. <laughs> so I didn't have a business plan or any of that sort of stuff. So I did all that sort of stuff, got approved, and then went around and shopped it to the various banks, which you know, you take this approval letter and you say, hey, would you be willing to finance me? What are your rates? Well, then the US government got involved. And they said, hey, you know, here's an SBA file for loan, which is a, I will speak positively about it now, uh, but because the SBA will, you know, finance it, it's 10% down. You know, normal banks right now, especially um, if you're going to occupy the building, this is kind of cool facts. If you're going to occupy the building you're about to purchase, um, the banks generally say, hey, you know what, 30% down, we're pretty likely going to finance you. It's been worse since all the, the credit crunch on it. But SBA says, hey, 10% down. So you put down 10% and we'll finance a portion of it and the bank finances the last of it. SBA, the government, our lovely government was the one who did not have the money on the day of closing. We literally got to the, you know, that was at the table with all the things that you're supposed to sign and that other guy missed the party. And uh, so I lost that building. I lost my bed. Uh, I was crushed. I was absolutely horrible, horribly crushed because not, not only is that, oh yeah, I've had tons of failures, you know, every, all of us have, you know, especially if you're more successful, the more failures there are, um, you know, the other speakers I guarantee will say you know, the same things. But that one was a kick in the gut because that was like, I actually lost, I lost, I didn't just fail, I lost a lot. Um, I called the owner of the building, it was a company, a company out of Idaho, who, who the hell owns businesses in Idaho? But I, apparently they do. Um, and I called all the way up the company, and I got to the vice president of the company. And mind you, I'm 21 years old. I'm freaking the fuck out. I'm absolutely terrified because I lost money. I don't have this building. I have nowhere to go. I'm in 500 square foot, um, having my whole business run out of this place. And I have a panoramic picture of how the business looked at that time. It was insane. Um, I got to the vice president of the company, and I'm like, sir, I'm so sorry. It wasn't my fault. It was my fault, but it wasn't my fault. I'm gonna take blame. He cuts me off and he's like, I've been in business for 25 years and I have never seen any sort of shit like this happen. And I'm like, honestly, sir, I've been in business for, I think it was three, you know, three, three official years. And I'm like, and you allow me to purchase this building will not make my life easier. It's going to make it more rewarding. You know, and I just, I just rattled off. I was very honest, came straight from the heart. That guy goes, I want another 10 grand and you get two weeks. I'm like, huh. <laughs> so I went and, uh, Gave him, you know, wrote another 10 grand. Now, so now I'm out 35 grand if the government doesn't come through. And I had no indication that the government was going to do it, but I just, I just, uh, again, I came from the heart. I was like, I'm, I'm going to do this. This is my thing. I, I'm going to obsess about it until I get through. What happened was, um, I ended up calling my um, U.S. representative. We had done, we had fixed their computers. So, um, and that has nothing to do with the SBA, mind you. Our representative has, you know, congressman has nothing to do with the SBA. They didn't know each other. Or, Departments. And so, but they did. They called, they called until they got and said, hey, this is Congressman Dingle, who was the high, longest serving uh, congressman in the United States. So that had some weight. Um, 
ends up the day of this guy comes, you know, the courier dude comes strolling in with whatever 40% of that money. Um, we closed that day. We have, I ended up owning the building. And mind you, there's millions of, there's bigger deals that go on every day. You know, some of you guys will even have much larger success stories, but honestly that was a 21 year old kid who had no formal education, no formal anything, um, actually getting his dream building. The most insane part about the whole thing is that the um, real estate guy that was dual representing his um, their real estate guy, he goes, all the stuff was signed, he goes, what? Did you say to the owner of the, the company? And I'm like, I, I, I just wanted the building. I'm like, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't. He goes, that guy turned out an offer for $1.2 million to let you buy the building. That sounds, I, I, I sound stupid, honestly, now as I'm older. I'm like, wow, that, that was a stupid idea on his part. But, uh, <laughs> but as a kid, of course, I'm like, well, that's because I deserved it. I, was, I earned it. I, you know, I, we talked man, man to man sort of thing. Um, coolest thing ever. That vice president ends up calling me maybe four months later. He found my company's number, you know, looking us up on the internet and whatnot. Called me and that guy goes, did I make the right decision? And I'm like, absolutely. You absolutely did. He was good. I thought, I thought that was the right thing to do. And so I guess what I, the, the cool moral of that story is that when you want it bad enough and you persevere and you push and you you find ways. I mean, there was. If I followed the rules legally, I lost money. Legally, I was. You know, I, this was the path I went. I was supposed to just take, you know, pack up my stuff and go. I, I lost it. But I actually created and cut my own path. And I, I hate to say this because it sucks to say this, but I honestly believe all the major successes in, in my world, my experiences, come from just actually just saying, you know what? I have to make my own my own path. Is that if you end up saying, you know, I'm going to follow the rules. I'm going to prove that I'm the best person ever, I'm going to prove it to everyone else, and somebody's going to reward me for that. Honest to God, that never happens. I mean, yeah, you might get a raise, you might get a bonus and that sort of stuff, but it, I have not seen in my own life where, unless you cut your own path and say, you know what, this is, this is, I'm going to do this, this is, I believe in it, absolutely, does it really come tr come through um, with that sort of great force. And, quite frankly, Jack, I'm just, oh, he's not here, I keep going. Um, so, <laughs> I love to talk. When people start walking out, that's your cue. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, 17 minutes. 17 minutes. Yeah, just... Okay, I'm good. So, um, so let's, say, let's take a very materialistic example of my life and see why I'm going to defend that it's not so materialistic. Um, purchasing a Lamborghini. Mind you guys, I'm not, I'm wealthy. Uh, more, I'm wealthy more so than I'm rich. I, I make great money. I've got a lot of buildings, businesses, and whatnot. It's only multiplying, it's only growing. But I would argue that I'm one of the wealthiest people in this room. And that's not the competition. I just think that on a scale of being very satisfied with where you are in life and the, the things you've accomplished, the people that you've got the experience with, I honestly lead a very awesome life. I have a, a very fulfilled life. Um, and, and I only do things now at this point that I want to continue fulfilling them. Anyway, point is, is that that damn Lamborghini. That car is such a weird thing. That's the most materialistic thing you can buy. That's the most, hey, look at me. It's, it's even attention more yellow. It's, ye it's a bright yellow <laughs> car. <laughs> Say, hey, look at me, right? Um, and I lost a couple friends. Oddly enough, I lost a friend. Well, they weren't really friends. And you kind of look at it kind of retrospectively. Um, they weren't really friends to begin with. But, um, Buying that car was such an interesting life experience because that was an obsession since second grade. It was not, I want all the chicks, I want, I want that life, I want to look cool, I want to be all that sort of stuff. I mean, that's, that's kind of a connotation that comes with such an excessive vehicle. But I wanted it because it went 202 miles an hour and the doors opened up. <laughs> second grader in me was like, that's all I want. And I had a Guinness Book of World Records from 1992 where it was the world's fastest street production vehicle. 202. And I was like, I'm going to do 202 miles in that car someday in my life. And truly, it was an obsession. And I, I, I would argue that the things that in my life that have actually come through, the things that I've actually wanted to happen in my life, only happened because they were obsessions. Now, I don't think obsessions are healthy, but being normal is unhealthy, I think. Is that, <laughs> it's, it's like trying to, anytime I've ever tried to fit in, and I, honestly, God, I do. Come on. I'm not going to stand up here and be like, yeah, I'm cool, I'm special. I'm like, no, I, 
want to be, I want to be like everybody else. I want to, you know, I want to be part of the world. I want to be, you know, involved in all that. And I want to be accepted. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with being accepted. You know, be liked by people. I'm friends with everybody. But uh, that car, though, and get back to that, that that car was not. That was a very bold statement. You know, you're going to buy this, and you're going to make it clear that I don't have kids. <laughs> that I, I wanted a car instead of a kid. Because everybody in my own world that has kids instead of a car. <laughs> Can't even find a girl to, find, to have kids with me, but um, that's a whole different issue. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, this car, I bought it, and I didn't tell anybody, and I financed it. I'm not. I, I guess. I, I guess I want to use. I think that I'm a good liaison between that. The, the, there's kind of those two worlds: the world where people are and then where they think they want to be. I kind of. I'm kind of in that middle level, and especially for my upbringing, like I was just telling Ellen. Ellen and I drove up here together. Like, I get excited if somebody buys me lunch, like, or, you know, gives me a free t-shirt. I'll, I'll drive up to Harvard do for a free t-shirt, you know? <laughs> it, it costs me a couple hundred bucks in gas and all that, and all, you know, my weekend, but, you know, my, my, my mentality is still stuck in that sort of phase. So I feel like I'm kind of stuck between those two worlds of where I am and where, so I, I feel like I can speak from experience in, in both senses. So with, with buying that car, and the reason that matters so much is that, I was actually really upset when I bought it. And I financed it, which wasn't my dream. My dream, you know, like everybody's dream is, oh, I'm gonna buy cash. And, uh, a couple of these guys have you know, bought their cars in cash. That's very impressive. I'm very you know, proud of my friends that's done that. I was not that guy. I had to finance it. But I got my, you know, you gotta, you gotta look at your goals. My goal was to have a Lamborghini by the time I was, before my high school reunion, you know, it, I accomplished that goal. Now I accomplished it, like, just barely tripping over that, that line. Like, that is technically, uh, by all means, Legally, roughly that goal, but um, I didn't specify I wanted to pay cash or anything like that. I just got a fair bit of them accomplished. Mind you, my money for that Lamborghini, well, originally um, I had spent more than a million dollars prior to buying the car on inventing a project. You know, I, I get obsessed, I have a vision, I was like, I'm going to make this thing, it's going to be awesome, it's a social network. This is before Facebook existed, um, and it was a business social network. Build, you know, businesses all to, to do commerce and all sort of shit. All that stuff exists now, and I'm not saying that I even came up with it. It was just, it, it makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of social networks out there, and if you think hard enough, it's generally where the world was going. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it wasn't unique. It was just like, hey, now the computer's getting powerful enough, the internet, web 2.0, this is kind of where everybody's going. I built it, failed miserably. Um, it didn't fail miserably, it failed slowly. It slowly failed, which is the worst ever. But, so I spent my money investing in that, so then I ended up having to finance a car that I wanted. The uh, whole point of this story about this car is once I finally got it, I was miserable. Um, I accomplished this second grade dream and it was an obsession. And you sit there and go, holy shit, this is the car. I'm standing next to this piece of metal, bright yellow, now what? <laughs> like, it, it doesn't drive itself, I have to drive it. It's, you know, and it's not the most comfortable car. And being an older Lamborghini, it is the most uncompromising vehicle. It's not a luxury car. The modern ones are more luxurious. I've had a chance to drive a variety of them. And they're, they're more comfortable, not more luxurious. This thing is an engine strapped to a chassis strapped to a couple wheels. It is a raw sports car. And it is the coolest car ever. Now, I own a lot of cars, but that is the, that is the coolest car I've got. And I was done. My life. I got, I got this. I didn't have any other goals. That was it. And so I went into this really weird, like, depressive state the moment I bought the car. Because I'm like, okay, now, now what? I didn't think of anything else. I didn't think of what would happen once I actually got it. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to make YouTube videos. I'm going to start filming stuff. But instead of filming like, oh, hey, guys, check out my car. Isn't this the coolest thing? All right, cool. Which a lot of people do. And that's not wrong, because people want to see that sort of shit. But that's not me. Instead, I was sharing pe with what people with what it's that's a weird sentence. Sharing with people what it was like to own that car, what it actually was like. I kept my videos were all about what it's actually like, and I shared um, various videos on don't here's what not to do in business. I can't tell you what to do because I don't know, <laughs> uh, but I can tell you what not to do. And uh, so YouTube started growing. And you know what's the coolest thing about this? All of this whole world that I've gotten, I'm, I'm up here speaking honestly, probably because I'm in, I do YouTube stuff. I'm not wealthiest, I'm not the richest, I'm not particularly notable, but I think I'm kind of entertaining. I think I can think hold a speech without looking at my notes. Um, moderately inspirational, 
I'm not a, I'm not a success coach. I'm like, yeah, guys, you're cool, man, motivation. You know, I'm, I'm not that guy either. I think I'm pretty realistic. But all of that combined gives me a chance to come up here and just share and what, what, I guess what, what, what life is like when you've got this point. And I'm in, a, like I said, I'm in a middle stage right now. So what's coming up in the future is just reinvesting in myself, reinvesting in the businesses. You know, I've got to um, do really well with real estate, just kind of just growing all that sort of stuff. So I don't know, just wanted to share some observations and experiences of uh, why it's not so materialistic. And uh, wanted to take any questions if anybody had any sort of questions or concerns or uh, comments. So, anything? Brian, I'm gonna get yeah. throw me one. Uh, with your real estate, do you deal mostly with flipping real estate, or do you no. own and just put businesses in there? That sort. Of um, I, for example, the building I told the story about. That building I bought, I didn't need all the space. And legally, when you buy or when you uh, you know finance a building, it's either called real. Uh, um, investment real estate or your actual property. And as long as you're in 51% of the building, um, it's your actual property. So guess how much, what percentage of that building I inhabited? 51% legally. And so I leased, I leased out the rest of it to a local regional pizza chain called Happy's Pizza. Right. And um, they, quick friend, I'll be honest, because I like being honest, they did, they, the amount that they paid me per month was more than the note on the building. So I actually, Owning that building made me money without. I was paying. I was getting more than I was paying out. And and that was a pain in the ass to get that deal done. But now I sit there. I don't have to do. I don't have to do shit. And and I I, I building equity in the building and um, being paid to do it. So yeah. In the beginning, you talked a lot about you know medical IT. Yes. And now you're talking about real estate. So I guess my question is, how do you decide what you want to get into and what you want to try? And and what you would be best at. Yes. Um, I can tell you, I don't know what the hell I'm best at. <laughs> that, you know, I think that I have a, a, situ I have a situation where I, um, I'm not going to say I have ADD, you know, there's a good excuse it is that. I have all over the map. I get into something, I want to learn it, I want to I know what it's like to run cam camera systems. And so then I get into YouTube and get obsessed with all that sort of stuff. Um, I struggle with that. I think that that's a very realistic thing for everybody to struggle with. Is that I'm good at some things. I'm really good at computers. I enjoy computers. I am good at it though. And so, um, I, I, I enjoy is not the right word. I'm not fulfilled by it. And so, the YouTube stuff that fulfills me makes me next to nothing. And I don't really want to make tons of money off of that because that, that seems it's cheap an experience. But the point is, is that. I, I struggle with that too, is that commercial real estate, I'm really good at, but you don't sit there and do commercial real estate all day long. You set up the deal and now for the next 20 years, Happy Pizza owes me this much money. You know, so now I'm sitting on my ass with one of my best deals. And so, um, like I said, is that there's a distinct difference between am I doing something that fulfills me or am I doing something I'm really good at and make a lot of money at. The idea is to try and make them all come together. I am not an expert at speaking on that because I have three, four different things. I own a, um, a detail shop as well. I bought a detail shop last year out from a, a person that was uh, struggling because I'm into cars. So I have six cars, might as well have a detail shop to store some of them at. And so um, honestly, that business has gone green, red, green, red. And so I, not, not because I'm spread out doing too many things, I have time. It's just that because I'm not focused. And so there is a problem where even, even when you're already so expertly awesome at, at doing business and whatnot, you've made money, you can still be in the wrong business. And some of them suck, you know. <laughs> and so instead of getting on there and bashing them, I just don't. I don't. But um, I do get offers, a lot of offers. to like, hey, talk about our, our company. I, I haven't taken money 
I get, I get, right now I'm monetizing in the sense that you have to watch commercials and shit and shit and that. But um, I'm in a growth phase, so I'm really making it nice and lean and whatnot. Um, I'm in the top 100 automotive channels. It's all, it's, it's, we consider automotive channel. Um, I even, even the majority of the money I make from it, I end up, if you license a song, if you say, hey, you know, I want this song in the video, the artist ends up making all the money off the video, you don't even make any money. But at the same time, it's because I want the art, I want that video to be, I want it to do, use that song. And so um, it's kind of, it's, it's more of like an outlet for my vision or my dreams at this point. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, uh, my goal is to have it to be a powerhouse to where I can go and, and have sponsorship deals. It's stuff that I, I don't need money, so it's stuff that I like. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. So you get players and models, so that would probably follow. Yeah. Uh, what are the three most important skills you have? What's that? What are the three most important skills you have that make you successful from your point of view? Uh, I have a really good smile. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I think that is actually uh, a very important skill, is that I treat everybody um, how I want to be treated. And that's not that's not some second grade stuff. That's actually, um, like I am blown away. I mean, I, let's be honest, I'm up here speaking, but either A, I can guarantee one of you guys either is worth more than I am, or knows more than I do about this. So let's be honest, that you, I'm, I'm appreciating that you're letting me speak to you, and that's why I'm trying to be entertaining, because you're letting me waste your time. So um, respect is a very, I think in my world, that is a huge thing. So that's, that's you know, respect, treat people like you treat as one. Um, two is, I'm always learning. I didn't go to college the traditional way. I was accepted to uh, college when I was 13. Took the ACTs as like a placement I did, ended up doing really well. And so I, I went to college, my dad made me take calculus when I was 13. I got a C, which my dad about murdered me. <laughs> about murdered me. That was a very tough moment. Because um, I just didn't like doing homework. And uh, I, but, so it, I always learn, always absorbing. So that's number two, I can go into stories about that, but I'm not trying to shut my mouth. So um, that, that's number two. Number three is, um, let's, let's cheat to say be nice. You know, we, we could other people. Yeah. After buying a Lamborghini and finding yourself in that phase where you didn't know what to do next, um, what what were you able to do to get yourself to get over that and you know keep going? It's not only dealing with failure, but also dealing with the success and you know continuing to grow and have a lot of things to do. There's a moment when I went to the club and I only wanted to take my car to the club twice. This girl came up to me, gorgeous girl, came up to me, and she says, "I'll go home with you." <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She knew I she saw me get out of the car. She didn't see my girlfriend get out of the car in the passenger seat. <laughs> and so the first thing I said, because I'm cracking up, because I'm like, I thought that was a figure of speech. I thought that was implied. I didn't think you literally, that when you go on the Lamborghini, girls would literally say that, which uh, some of that type does. Um, <laughs> So I was like, as long as you don't mind sitting in my girlfriend's lap, that was my immediate response. <laughs> my girlfriend kind of laughed. It was a joke. It really was a joke. Was that, you know, if the girl's going to go home with you because you have a Lamborghini, I don't know what other car owner she's got home with. <laughs> but the point is, is that I was like, man, it, that person literally just judged me based on that vehicle. And I honestly got, that's a piece of machinery. Now, I love, I love that car to death. I absolutely love that thing to death. But, you know, not everybody does. Is I realized I want to be valued for who I am. Uh, I, I think I'm a good person. I'm very honest. I try to be really good. I don't have any skeletons in my closet. I don't have anything crazy. Maybe I'll work in politics today because I don't have anything to hide. But the point is, is that, that 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 was one of those moments where I'm like, I need to, I need to do something that's more notable. Now, mind you, I was on the Bachelor before I went to the uh, before I went to Lamborghini. And if you Google me, Bachelor was the number one shit that showed up under my my name. I hated that. Because um, I'm well for episode. Come on, like, I didn't even have any awesome stories. So um, my goal was at that point was like, you know, I want to be known for something more, for contributing more to the world. So I really started the YouTube stuff from uh, that whole realm of just being a assumed to be a playboy. <laughs> yeah. It sounds it sounds like you've never had to deal with. A Lex Luthor or a personal doubt in, in, from coming from you. Right, right. Is it am I right? Is that true? Um, you know what? I, I lead a very charmed life, and, and, and I'm gonna see if I can answer your question. Um, I'm oh, I'm my as you guys all are. I'm my worst critic. You know, I really doubt a lot of the richest guy here. You're not. You, you didn't. You didn't get that old, dog. You're you have a piece of shit. 
And so you can, and I guarantee every one of you guys can do that, or have done it, or doing that. You know, you can go in the car back when you're, and some of you have cars when you walk, I guarantee. You go home and whip yourself because you think you're horrible. Or you think you are. You know, very, very critical of yourself. Um, I still am. And so that's relative, though. Standing here is a very, is a huge honor. I've always wanted to come to Harvard and see this, so that it's honorable for me to come. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna high right now. But you know, you think about it. You have a moment where you're like. I could have done this a lot easier, I could have done better. So, you know, the, the ultimate answer to your question is every time I feel like shit for those reasons, I go and make a YouTube trying to help prevent other people from doing those. So I'll, I'll have a video on whatever, whatever is ups, I'm angry about at that moment. So that's my, that's my, yeah. But that's where the motivation to make those videos. Anybody? For some of your influences. Uh, you have nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Who well, I've met, he's actually a really cool guy at the Sigma party, that was the, Thing ever. Um, no, um, that's a really good question because I don't have many influences, and I'm not saying oh because I didn't have influences I did it all by myself. I just love absorbing from a lot of different sources, and I've met a handful of people that I look up to. And they were all assholes, and you know, you know, the problem with that though was because they're all car guys, and they, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge car fanatic. And car people are very testosterone driven. Oh, I'm a winner, I'm you know, the best. And when you meet them, they want to push you down. Like, I have, a, I have a Mazda RX-7, I'm a big RX-7 guy. And I have one of the fastest ones. I didn't build it originally. I built my other one, and then I rebuilt this one, built poorly. And so when I had it, I met, I met one of the guys that I looked up to. He was like, oh, well, yeah, you can't drive it. I'm like, yeah, that's true, I can't drive it. But uh, I suck at driving the car. But the point was that he was a complete dick. And so the people I've looked up to, I've, I've honestly, you know, that's why whenever people meet me, I try to give them that best thing because I was jaded. I was jaded from a couple of people I looked up to that were, when I met them. I met Bill Gates. That was really cool. I guess I look, I look up to him. You know, he's a lot nicer than people think. Steve Jobs. At least I can't say that. Yeah, yeah. Any, anything else? One last question. Right? No, you said um, that you're kind of in the middle of where you are and where you want to be. Yes. Uh, what are your plans for the future? Like, what are you looking to invest in next? Or, like, what are your future goals? Um, well, near future, I'm currently buying five, uh, a set of five buildings. Um, so that's that's a current business venture I've been working on right now. Um, I'm, my buddy Alan is, is the expert in this, so don't don't think that this is even in his level. But I, I'm building an app, but it was an app because I wanted a feature on my phone. I build, I'm truly building it for myself, and then I'm gonna release it and see if other people like it. And it has to do with automotive, so it, I'm gonna broadcast it to all my subscribers, see if they want it to. Maybe they don't, I don't care. It, it's, I wanted it, I can use it on my phone. So those are two of the like unique projects. Other than that, honestly, like my core business, it grows when Monroe grows. Monroe's not growing, so it's it, I, I could I could go on for a long time about being stuck in a spot because the world around me I'm in the wrong world. I got stuck in Monroe because of my business, and I should be here. I should be at places where there's a lot of educated people trying to do more with their lives. Like I said, that's one of the reasons I do YouTube because I get to interact with people that I think good.